going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Every day, dozens of people who are arraigned for misdemeanors and felonies and have no capability of paying for an attorney are appointed a public defender. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. The public defender system is not something provided out of kindness. It is a constitutional obligation grounded in the Sixth Amendment of the Bill of Rights, which guarantees a speedy and public trial, an impartial jury, the right to be confronted and to present witnesses, and to have the assistance of counsel. That right was not extended uh, from the federal courts to the state courts until the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in the case of Gideon versus Wainwright in 1963. Writing for a unanimous court, Judge Hugo Black stated that it is, quote, the obvious truth that lawyers in criminal courts are necessities, not luxuries, and the right of one charged with a crime to counsel may not be deemed fundamental and essential to fair trials in some countries, but it is in ours. In July, the National Legal Aid and Defender Association, an advocacy group for frontline attorneys and equal justice professionals, issued this report taking Gideon's Pulse, an evaluation of the office of the Hamilton County Public Defender. Although sympathetic to local officials on whom the bulk of responsibility for funding falls and complementary of what it calls the emerging efforts by local elected officials and the office to meet its responsibilities, the report states there is little doubt that poor people charged with crimes facing a potential loss of liberty are not afforded the constitutional protections demanded by the United States Constitution. To discuss the implications of this report this morning, I am joined now by Lou Shrigeri, the head of the Public Defender Office in Hamilton County. Angelina Jackson is an attorney who serves as the Race and Justice Project Director for the Ohio Justice and Policy Center. And Peter Rosenwald, a local attorney who started out in the Public Defender's Office when it was part of Legal Aid and is now in private practice. Mr. Rosenwald takes cases as an outside Public Defender. Welcome to uh, Newsmakers, all of you. Um, this is, in my mind, a very important situation and a very important function that is provided uh, here in this county and every county in the United States. But, Lou, let's start out. What is it that your office does and who does it do it for? Well, we do it for the indigent clients, meaning that uh, they have to be qualified to, uh, to uh, be represented. And uh, once they are qualified to be represented, this counsel is assigned. It's assigned within the same day of arrest. Uh, if you were arrested like last night, you would uh, get a lawyer this morning and the lawyer would appear with you to have a bond set and uh, continue with the representation and that's the service that we provide on a daily basis. So in fact we're taping on a Friday morning your staff would have been in the courts this morning uh, talking to people who were arrested last night or yesterday, that's, that's right? That's correct. That's where I'm just coming from. Right, that's right. Half hour. <laughs> we actually had to move our, our taping back a little bit to, to provide for that. Let's make it clear these are criminal cases not civil cases. These are people who have broken the law either misdemeanors or felonies. Mm -hmm. Civil cases are handled for the indigent by the Legal Aid Society. That's correct. But in this county, the def Public Defender's Office is different than Legal Aid. That's not true yes. everywhere. It's, it, it's different and it's also publicly funded. Uh, the Legal Aid Society is a nonprofit organization. We're uh, incorporated uh, and we follow Chapter 120 of the Ohio Revised Code and that's the that's the rules and regulation that we have to apply on the representation of clients. Of course, that, as you indicated, we represent on all the criminal cases, which means felonies, the more serious types, and uh, misdemeanors. Uh, now, for misdemeanors, we do have a staff because uh, there's a good number of them, meaning 35, 40,000 on in the, in the course of a year. And on the felonies, we have about 10, 15,000. Now, we handle them different for the reason that I think uh, the staffing is done at the misdemeanor level in the assigned counsel system 
is done through uh, the court, and we handle both of them in the office. Okay, so misdemeanors are handled by your staff, and how many That's people correct. do you have on your staff? Uh, about 30 with supervisors. And 30. then for felonies, you turn to outside, outside counsel. counsel and hire them. That's correct. Okay, Peter, you're one of those, That's right? true, yes. You, as, as I mentioned before, you started out doing public defender work when the public defender's function was inside legal aid, but you've yes. been out, you're uh, a sole practitioner. How much of your caseload is assigned, is public defender type of cases versus paying clients who come to you and ask for representation? I, I can't give you an accurate number of cases, but I can go back when they were doing the survey last year that statistically the income, if you will, I received from the public defender office for assigned cases was about 10% of my overall gross for that for 2006, but hour-wise it was roughly 25%. Uh, generally speaking, probably in the neighborhood of 40 to 60 cases a year would be my guess. 40 to 60 cases? Right. For you as an individual? Correct. Now, you've been around a long time. I don't want to say how long, but Thank you've been you. around a long time. <laughs> and uh, you, I, my understanding is you get some of the most difficult cases, too. And it tends to happen. And it's not just through the public defender office. You also get calls from judges okay. that say, come over and take a, take a case on. So it happens quite often. OK. Um, well, I want to be clear about this. I mean, felonies are the more serious crimes. Correct. Those are the crimes that we turn to outside attorneys to, um, to take on. Not every attorney out there, though, that, I mean, people probably know lots of lawyers in town who maybe do corporate work or do all sorts of other things. Not every attorney can just be called in and asked to, um, to represent somebody who's charged with a felony. No, they, they shouldn't do that, as a matter of fact. Uh, for example, I don't know anything about workers' compensation. I can spell the words but I would never go do that. And that's true for other lawyers. Y you really need to have knowledge in the area. Uh, the bulk of my practice is criminal defense. I like to believe I understand and know what I'm doing and can be helpful to the client. Uh, other lawyers who don't know it, quite frankly, should stay away. Angie, um, the report that came out last month in July um, has a lot of different observations, and we'll get to some of the specifics. But one of the key ones is that there's just not enough funding, either to pay loose staff or to adequately pay outside attorneys. What are some of the implications that, from the study's point of view and from uh, your point of view, of that situation where there is just not enough resources to, uh, to support this sort of function? Well, the, the lack of funding is um, a root of this problem, and it's um, having serious practical implications on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of the services that are being provided. Um, what the study found is that the staff attorneys are overloaded and overwhelmed. Their caseloads are so high that, for example, the staff attorneys, the misdemeanor staff attorneys, only have an hour and 42 minutes per case. And, and that includes even if they go to court, right? Absolutely. That's for investigation, legal research, communicating with their client, filing motions, going to trial if they're going to go to trial, or advocating for alternatives um, to incarceration if it's going to be a plea negotiated situation, um, an hour and 42 minutes per case. And so in sum, the, the lack of funding is one of the root causes of this system, this broken system. So the report says that of the attorneys in Lou's office, they're carrying two and a half times the caseload that's recommended by the American Bar Association. Lou, what do you say about that? I mean, however you state it, two and a half times more than what is recommended, an hour and 42 minutes per case. Uh, what do you think are the implications it of that? It depends on the kind of case. Uh, you can go from uh, disorderly conduct to, to uh, DUI, uh, to leaving the scene of an accident, assault, domestic violence. Those are the more serious cases that municipal court uh, handles. Uh, now, based on the, on the fact that uh, we have so many cases and so many clients, 
is that the lawyer has to make some decisions as to what he spends his time on. And I would hope that with the expertise that we've developed over the years, that a lawyer is able to do that. So if a, if a case requires more time, he's able to devote whatever time it would take. If it requires investigation, he would determine that he needs to do that. If it requires a jury trial, he would determine that it needs that. So it's, it's an on, on a per case basis that what uh, Angie's talking about is on an hour and 42 minutes on an average. Right. Uh, but uh, I, would, uh, I would tell you that uh, we uh, investigate and we research and, and we uh, try cases on an everyday basis, and again, depending on the seriousness of the case. How many, you have about 30 attorneys? That's correct. Okay. Now, th another part of this is, and one of the things that I found really interesting was the idea that in, and they're not just talking about your office, they're mm -hmm. talking about nationwide, I think this is an issue, that we publicly fund, obviously, the prosecutor's offices, and but prosecutors, and we're publicly funding constitutionally, it's an obligation, public defenders, but we pay public defenders a lot less than we pay prosecutors, and consequently, and you're talking about one of your attorneys has to make the judgment based on experience and whatever, which cases to spend time on. But doesn't that mean that you're going to tend to get younger attorneys, less experienced attorneys who don't have the ability to make those, or maybe, and secondly, don't have the freedom to really make those decisions to spend the amount of time and resources they need? Well, those lawyers would not get the more serious cases, for instance, and as uh, Mr. Rosenwald indicated, you know, at the felony level, for instance, we don't we don't. We would not assign uh, a younger attorney to more serious cases uh, as Pete would, and uh, they would get the fourth and fifth degree felonies. Uh, at the staff level, uh, they are, they're part. It's all part of the mix. It's whatever walks in, and then we have a mentoring system that then we put lawyers through some training. It may not be enough. Uh, it may not be. In, the salaries are not enough to. Uh, in fact, starting it would be okay. But when, when it comes to keeping people and at the supervisory level and the more experience uh, that they gain, they would tend to leave, of course, because uh, it, I think that they, they probably can make more on the outside. What's the starting salary? Uh, we start them at 37 and... Uh, and what? And then 42,000, that's, that's the next step up. And then you go to supervisory level that would be in the 50s. and. We just got granted permission to hire some felonies attorneys, and they get paid 52. So, Peter, how does that sound in the world of attorneys? I can tell you, though, when I left the public defender office at the end of 1977, my salary was 21,000, and now it's 37. So it's not a very large increase. I, there's some sort of rule of 72 that would say it should be somewhere in the 40s or upper 40s. Um, that's not a lot of money. Um, I can tell you for the assigned cases, the hourly rate is $45 per hour, which is less than a fifth of what my normal hourly rate is. So would if be. somebody, if I came to you and I needed your, uh, I needed to hire you as an attorney, you would tell me your hourly rate is? 250. 250. You're getting 45. One of the things that the uh, study says is that in addition to it only being 45, that you're restricted to how many hours you can even report. That's true, and I, and I have to take some responsibility for that because back in 2004 when we came up with this various caps, uh, a lot of lawyers were dis disappointed. You would go into court, be ready for trial, the case is dismissed, you put a bunch of time in, but you didn't get paid for it because if there was a low level for dismissal. Uh, I think we need to revisit the salaries uh, or the pay scale uh, the federal government for appointed counsel pays $100 per hour in or out of court. Uh, we need to eliminate the caps and, and come up with some sort of reasonable amount that would be a total cap, cap, not just a mix of caps, which we have right now. Angie, just on this point, on prosecutor salaries versus uh, public defender salaries pay for outside attorneys who function in a public defender role, what what would this report, what would people who uh, come at this from your perspective, what would you say just about salaries? Well, um, anecdotally, let me tell you this. In the year 2000, 
I was managing children's apparel for JCPenney, and I made more money than a juvenile public defender does now. So I was making more money managing children's clothes than the people who are making huge impact on children's lives make. And I think that that says it in and of itself right there that um, the, the, the pay situation is, I mean, it, 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 the disparity between prosecutor and public defender pay is unacceptable. Okay, there's a lot of other details, and you're not going to believe this, but we're out of time for the first half, but we're going to come back. Everybody sit tight. Stay tuned. After the break, we will look at the recommendations for what can be done to address the criticisms in this report. Welcome back. In these sorts of situations, it sounds as if the only thing that can be done is to spend gobs more money. The National Legal Aid and Defense Association report specifically notes that spending more money is difficult for state and local governments. On the other hand, this is a constitutional obligation, not an optional program. What government entity is responsible for funding the public defender programs varies greatly between uh, states to states how much is carried by the state and how much is carried by the local entity. Here you can see a map. The green states are the states where 100% is carried by the states. The two red states, uh, South, South Dakota and Pennsylvania, totally locally funded. The yellow states, which Ohio is part of, it's split between the two in the case of less than 50% coming from the state. Uh, in 1976, Ohio set out to pay 50% of the cost, but over time, that has fallen to somewhere around 26%. So where do we go from here? Well, that's the question. Angie, this report has a lot of recommendations. One of it is that the real problem here is on the state level. It's not, it is not on the funding side. It is not on the county level. It's the state that carries the most burden and, and we should be advocating for a change and a reform in the system. Where do you see this and do, how possible do you even see this? Well, I think I absolutely agree with the fact that we, we, we need to have a joint concerted effort to advocate for more funding from the state. I think that is critical. And so we don't dispute um, that point at all. But uh, what should be emphasized um, is that we can't use that, the funding situation, um, as an excuse not to uh, provide the level of service that the Constitution requires. And some of the things that um, we think can help fix the system are things that are not going to be excessive in terms of cost. Um, these are things like establishing practice standards, instituting training, um, making sure that the office is politically independent. These are things that do not cost a lot of money. Okay, before we get to some of those, Lou, I want to turn to you. Sure. Um, I know from talking with you that you are totally supportive of advocating at the state level. No, no, no problem. To I think get that more that's funding. what we have to do. Okay. But there's also some other critiques in here that they involve money, but not the same amount. And that is that your staff, the, the attorneys on your staff, don't even have their own desk. You don't have a computer system for managing records. Um, People have to share desks. There's no privacy to talk to clients. You know, those are the sorts of things. I have to tell you, I was I was shocked. I was sort of amazed at, you know, the conditions under which your folks have to work. And it seems to me that that's something the county could do something about. Now I know it's going to cost money, but isn't that we've been. Um We've been advocating for those changes and those things over a period of a number of years. I've been public defender for going on 14 years. And year after year, we've asked for some of those. We've asked for more support. We've asked for better space. We've asked for larger space. In fact, I think we should have our own facility 
Uh, I've been looking at the Red Cross building on Sycamore that's for sale. That's right. And uh, I think that that's, we don't even belong in the same building with the prosecutor, in my opinion. And I because think you feel there's conflicts there? Yes, yes. And uh, the clients uh, feel constricted, and uh, plus there is no privacy, as you saw when I gave you a tour of the office. Uh, those things are being addressed, but not funded. I don't know how you go about it with these days of uh, budget uh, restraints. And not only at the local level, the state uh, got ordered to uh, cut budgets 10% all over the agencies, state agencies. Now, you add the 10% from the state plus the 6% that we've had to cut locally here, that's 16%. Right. So I don't know how you make do with 16% less. Let's take a look at some of these other things. The training question. Uh, Peter, both for in-house attorneys and people who are brought in, what sort of, how would you evaluate the training that's provided right now, and should we be looking at improving that? Oh, I think you can always improve. I'm not going to sit here and say that they don't have training. I know the hard part is when, when a new hire comes in or a lawyer speaking to staff gets moved from juvenile, they've, they've started the mentoring program, but I know for a while they didn't. And you can't just or shouldn't just throw somebody into the lurch. Uh, I know that Lou puts on seminars during the, the year that helps. I think we need to get the older attorneys, if you will, involved more so in, in supervising and watching. It will take time on our part, speaking as an older attorney. But what I want to see is effective quality representation, both on the staff level, both on the assigned counsel level. And we just have to work harder at it. Angie, uh, you and I were talking, there is a model in Kentucky for this educational mm -hmm. piece, right, that mm -hmm. looks promising. Mm -hmm. um, that's just one example of a training program. I, I don't practice in Kentucky, and so I can't speak to the details of that, uh, of that particular program, but, it, but it's one model. Um, but if I could, I just wanted to follow up mm -hmm. on, the, on the cost issue, and I think this is something that the public needs to understand about um, making choices about how we allocate our resources in terms of how the office is funded. If these attorneys are not able to effectively represent their clients, if they can't investigate, if they don't have space to talk to people, if they can't see if there's a drug problem or a mental illness underlying the offense, and if people are kind of pleading out and getting new convictions, we end up paying for these costs on the back end because new convictions lead to unemployment, they interfere with educational opportunities, they interfere with housing opportunities, and so we end up paying for all of that on the back end. And so I think we really have to think critically in terms of how we're going to allocate our resources. We know they're scarce. But if it, these are basic elements of legal representation, very basic, having spaces, having a computer, um, that if it, and, and having training and effective representation. If we have those um, and, and expend those costs up front, we're going to save tons on the back end. And I have an example of that. Our clinic students um, at OJPC represented a veteran who had a, a drug abuse problem, okay? He, uh, but he was working and he had an apartment. He was arrested. On a, drug, um, on a drug possession charge, he was sentenced to a year in jail. If he would have stayed in jail, he would have lost his job, lost his apartment, and likely come out with a drug problem. The students got together with behavioral health experts and they filed a motion to mitigate his sentence. He's now in drug treatment, okay? He kept his job, he kept his apartment, and the county saved approximately $20,000 that they would have expended to incarcerate him for a year just by taking the time to, to advocate for those alternatives. And these are the things we're talking about. Lou, you're in the trenches every day. Yes, How do you hear those um, when, when Angie brings those kinds of alternatives? I, uh, I, see, I do it every day. The sh I get calls from the sheriff that they can't handle some people, for instance, mental health problems. Uh, dialysis problems and then that's when you run to the judge you, you go file something immediately and uh, we do that every day yesterday in fact something like that happened they had to take this uh, woman that had a pregnancy a, a problem pregnancy and they had to take her to the hospital and uh, I, I got her mitigated I went and talked to the judge immediately then told her uh, judge Lisa Allen it was and uh, she let her out she mitigated and she got they took her right away to the hospital and and I just want to be clear. On an everyday basis. I, I want to be clear. I, I, 
you know, that we, we're not criticizing in, individual attorneys. We know that there are public defenders that care about their clients and that are advocating for their clients. But the problem is it's the system, okay? The system is not allowing for the, the level of advocacy that's required, um, you know, with the caseload burden and the lack of resources. So it's not gr criticism that, th that these attorneys okay. don't care. I have 30 seconds left. <clears throat> Your one thing I want you to elaborate on in 30 seconds sure. is the fact that juve a lot of these public defenders mm -hmm. start in the juvenile division and then move <clears throat> up, and juveniles <clears throat> being used as training. At least that's what the report says. Is that a concern? It can be a concern. I mean, you have to start somewhere. The problem is the juvenile system is totally different than the municipal court criminal justice system in the common police system. Uh, it at least gets them started, but they still need a lot more training to step up and handle misdemeanor and felony cases. This is a very complex situation. This report is complex. I recommend that people read it. And this is a situation where the person seems to be in the hot seat. Everybody's actually on his side so thank and you. wants to get it done. So thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the men and the women shaping our region for the future. Have a good week.